Okay, so we have lots to talk about now. We have obviously four weeks till Purim. Oh, sorry, got to start with, we have a sponsor tonight. Maybe we should do a drum roll. A sponsor tonight, let me read it. It is, um, this is the uh, sister and brother-in-law of Joel Take, who a lot of us know comes to shul, reg well, used to come regularly. Uh, his father's 96, Kanaina Hora is not well, should have a refor shalema. Rachmil Oizeb and Eti Rachel, but his uh, his um, cousin Julian and Orit Sperber are sponsoring tonight in honor of the Yort site last Wednesday of Joel's mother and the people who are sponsoring his aunt, Chana Bas Yitzchok David. So tonight's Shia should be Le'ilu Nishmas Chana Bas Yitzchok David. So that is uh, the second time I think we've been sponsored. So, uh, okay. So we have four weeks till Pesach. Four weeks today is the second day Pesach. So there's lots and lots to discuss. Uh, I know also when it comes to Pesach, people have a lot of questions that they want to ask. So we give more time for questions. Maybe we should do a specific question and answer session uh, share at some point. Um, although obviously the week of Pesach is very busy. People are busy cashering. Uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So maybe we'll do that the week before. We'll find a time, maybe an extra night. Uh, if people want to ask questions about specific things that they are uh, uh, interested in. So we've got lots to discuss. Pesach is a Sunday, very rare. Last time was 2008. Will happen again in four years' time, and then not again for 20 years. So it's one of the rarest times, uh, and that presents a lot of difficulties, which we will talk about. You know me, I like to give people the whole picture of why things are happening, why we are doing them, and how the halacha works in certain ways. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to a little bit of that. There's also a lot about the Pasha. We could say Pasha's Kisisa and the Egel and serving the golden calf. I want to touch on a little bit about that tonight um, because it needs understanding. It's one of the, perhaps you can say, the most difficult... Uh, incident stories perhaps in the whole Torah to understand uh, that and the selling of Yosef or perhaps in my opinion anyway the two hardest to uh, that need the most misunderstood chapters I want to speak a little bit about that tonight but I want to start those who are in shul tonight know that we said some Tehillim of thanks of gratitude to Hashem because today is the Hebrew anniversary of when our shul closed down at the start of the coronavirus. Last year, Purim was a Tuesday, and Friday morning was our last minion. So that would be today, Monday, right? Four days after uh, Purim was Friday, three days later. And of course, we were closed. We didn't have laning Pasha's Kisisa. So this week, we haven't laned it in Shul for two years. And we missed Pasha's Pora, which I'll talk about also a little bit. Pasha's Pora, we haven't heard for two years. And we obviously said, Psalms of thanks, we said Psalm 138, 139, because obviously we all survived, Baruch Hashem. I think uh, half a million Americans didn't, and many, many more around the world did not survive. Baruch Hashem, our shul only had five cases of people in Florida. There's a few more people who were snowbirds up north, which is, um, and Baruch Hashem, they all survived, and three of those got it through uh, going into the hospital, whatever. So we have a lot to be thankful to Hashem for. Obviously, our prayers are very important, and we have to thank Hashem at all times that we survived and we were saved and spared as individually, our families, our friends, uh, uh, and our shul and our community. So that's something we did at shul tonight. We're not going to do that now, but uh, people, their own people, should think about uh, what's gone on this year. I remember this time last year, everybody was in a panic. It was uh, a very, very, very unknown, scary, of course, time. And especially many people were supposed to be away for Pesach and they had to uh, rush around and try and cash her. And uh, as rabbis, it was very difficult times as well, very busy times. But I'd like to challenge you all now that it's been a year. And Judaism, as you know, we're constantly evaluating our own lives. 
we're evaluating our own thoughts, where we're holding, how we're going, how can we be better people, better Jews, right? Constantly, we're supposed to do that every night. Uh, we're supposed to make what's called a cheshpan and nefesh. We go through what we did during the day, what we have to say sorry to Hashem for, what we could have done better, what we're going to rectify, right? And of course, Yom Kippur, the big time when we make a cheshpan of the year. Every month, Rosh Chodesh is supposed to be a day of forgiveness. We say in the davening that it's a day of forgiveness. Zaman kapora lechol dodosam. It's a time of Hashem forgiving us. So every month, we're supposed to evaluate how we did that month, how we feel we could do better. Just like a business, right? A business is constantly evaluating how can we do things better, make things better, the whole stuff. So of course, now with the whole year from coronavirus, we should look back and we should see how we've, not physically, of course, but I'm you know what sort of people we are how we've improved how we'd be better what we could have done better and i'd like to challenge everybody to find one thing that we've done this last year that we would like to keep one thing that coronavirus has made us do or made us think about that we'd like to keep to continue and perhaps something that coronavirus has made us do that we don't want to continue now you don't have to tell me um, if you want to tell me or email me or let me know or whatever that you're entitled to do that, of course. But I just want people to focus on their on their own and so on. And I have a few thoughts and I want to share. One of them, those who know our shul know that I make a phone call every Friday. A robocall goes out to the whole shul. It's uh, three minutes because they won't let it, the system won't accept more than three minutes. So usually I try to do it around almost the three minutes, right? Maximize my, uh, my time with the shul members. And I think that's a wonderful thing because people actually get to hear me, to hear my voice. Especially in our shul, we have a lot of elderly people. Some don't have computers. A lot of people don't know how to use Zoom, right? How many times have we been on Zoom meetings with our shul, with the other shul? If you hear me, can you hear me? People don't realize their video is on. We can see everything in their house. Or we can hear everything in their house, right? And how many times have we been on systems like that, right? And, and, and see people in compromising positions. But so the phone call has been something that we did. I did it because when Chas Vashonim, somebody died, the shul would send a robocall of the details of the person who died and what's going to happen. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to speak to the whole congregation. I thought I'd do it because Pesach was coming last year. People were all nervous about Pesach. And then we carried it on. If you remember, we had a board meeting and they decided to pay because you only get a certain amount for the price tag. So they upgraded, they paid more money and I did it every week. And I think that was great. People got to hear me, got to say hello. A lot of people think it's me personally talking because I make it personal. Don't mention people's names. But that is something I want to continue, right? It's friendly, it's personable. So even when all the shul and everything is back to normal in Mitzah Hashem very soon, that is certainly something that I want to continue this weekly uh, phone call every week. And again, something that I uh, don't want to continue um, is the Zooming of the Minyanim services. Right? I think the shear and meetings and events, right? It's all wonderful to connect people. But I think the Minyan, people should be coming to shul. Right, there's a special bracha you come to shul. In fact, when you go to the base Amigdash, hopefully we'll get the opportunity soon. Every year you have to go three times, a pilgrimage festival, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sokas, to go to the temple. And the expression, it says, you have to go to the base Amigdash, Leiraos, to be seen, which is a strange expression. Who are you being seen by? The answer is God, God sees you there. And I'm not going into it now, we have lots to talk about tonight. But there's the idea of going there, you get the inspiration of the shul, you're part of the shul community, um, and therefore people should go. And when it comes chance to my shia, yes, we can still zoom it, don't worry, Mary, I know it's a bit far for you to come uh, from California. And we always did have my shia on Facebook, but as soon as it's uh, safe, if you remember for a few weeks, I did my shia back at the shul, but because of the, um, I, didn't, I don't have state-of-the-art recording equipment, so it didn't uh, come over very well. But as soon as it's safe to go back into the shul for my shear uh, and people to come definitely want to do that because coming and being there uh, is, is certainly a better, special way of doing it. So that is something I don't want to continue and go back to the old way of doing things. So I think it's important to challenge ourselves and to think 
um, you know, sort of things that we want to keep and certain things. I'm not talking about necessarily in davening and the shul and that stuff. You know, that's a, a much different discussion because if you ask people to say, yes, we like the short davening, right? We like to get over and done with it as quickly as possible when we get back, right? I'm not saying those sort of things, but I'd like to challenge people because, of course, there are many things, many cheshbonas, many ideas why Hashem brought the coronavirus. And I don't know them, but I'm not going to tell you them because I don't know them. I'm not going to say I know the reasons, but you can look into it and you see, right, what has happened? What has happened? Okay, certain things have changed. And last week we spoke about the irony of Purim, right? We mentioned that Purim, very ironic, in the sense that God's name is hidden. God is not there, but he is constantly moving all the pieces together. We spoke about how Purim, the Megillah, is very misogynist, right? It's not very good for the feminists, right? They hated women. We spoke about that last week. As soon as a woman starts to have a voice, they have to send letters, don't go around listening to your wives, right? They super vastly off with the head. The women, the whole process, like Hashem's new wives, right? And they had to spend a whole year getting ready. We went through all that as we, the irony was, who brought about the downfall of Haman? A woman. Who saved all the Jews? A woman. So you see the irony of it all. Uh, we spoke about many ironies in Purim. So I think there's also an irony in the coronavirus, in the sense that, of course, and it's been very, very hard and difficult for people. And no matter how hard people try to keep people together, especially with older people, people who are lonely, it's been very hard and terrible for them. So in some ways, of course, it's been very lonely for people, very lonely and very difficult for people. But when I say the irony is, because in some ways, people are much more together now in the sense that we've opened up a whole new world through this Zoom and through internet connections, right? We have the option now of watching, and I know people do in our shul, for instance, you can watch it, rabbis all over the world and their lectures, and you can spend hours watching this and that, and you can get a, all around the world, families who are miles away, let's say my family, for instance, most of my family and friends are not in America. So for me, it's an opportunity, because nobody would have thought of this earlier, right? Even though it's staring you in the face, but. There was no reason to have all these joint get-togethers all over the world. So in some ways, the irony is, yes, it's pushed us further apart and isolated people, but in some ways, it's brought people together in the sense that we're joined through technology. So there's many things to think about in the coronavirus, and I challenge you all to think through how you think you've managed, uh, how you think you're a better person, uh, better things that you're proud of, things that you're not proud of, and of course, uh, one can keep it to themselves, but I just wanted to, to bring that out. Okay, so this week is Pasha's Parah, the third of the four special Pasha's extra weeks that we read at the moment. Now, we haven't read it for two years, because last year we were all closed. But according to some opinions, the reading of Pasha's Parah is biblical in nature. We all know two weeks ago, we read Pasha's Zohar, the remembrance of Amalek, and... It was biblical, and I was sure put on a separate reading in the afternoon, and I think uh, about 19 people came especially for it. So I think that's something we should keep even with uh, when the coronavirus leaves us, right? Because it was a wonderful thing for uh, it was like 14 women who came who weren't coming early in the morning. So we did all that. But some people say Pasha's Parah is also biblical in nature. Very strange. How, what, where, why would reading about Pasha's Parah, what is it? It is the reading of the paraduma, the red heifer, right? The red cow, you took it, you slaughtered it, you burned it, you did this whole concoction, and you sprinkled that on the people who were tome, ritually impure, people who've been around dead bodies, who've gone into cemeteries, and therefore they could then go in and go to the temple, and we read it before Pesach, because you needed to purify yourself before you went to the temple to offer your sacrifice, your offering of Pesach. But some people say it's biblical. And the question is, well, where, what, who, and why? Where does it say you have to read it, you have to learn it? So where does it all come? So let me share my screen. As I say, I like to give people the whole picture, to educate people and give them a broader sense of what's going on. So let me, here we go. So again, many people say it's not biblical, it's only a rabbinic ordinance to read it. but 
there are a lot of people who say it's biblical. So this is the Aruch HaShulchan, who was uh, 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 Raparovitz, uh, his name has just gone out of my head now, uh, who, who wrote it. Um, um, anyway, I just thought of it, uh, gone, gone out of my head. Anyway, I suppose I'm getting old, so I keep forgetting these things. Maybe I should write them down. Okay, so the Aruch HaShulchan 685, so it's not in English, so we'll go through it in Hebrew. So many people say, Parashas Para, Zacha, we know we discussed that two weeks ago, are obligated, or you're obligated, they're obligatory to hear the laning, Minatora from the Torah, the Fichach, right? Everyone comes to Shul and we have the whole thing. Got to read it from the Torah, da 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 da. Right. So the question is, where, like we said, all the great latter day rabbis wonder. Where do we find this idea that this reading of the Paraduma, the ceremony of the red heifer, is in a Torah? There's nothing in the Gemara about it. There's no remez, right, in, 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 in the Gemara about anything to do with it being in a Torah. So that's why the majority of the rabbinic uh, halachic uh, uh, desires say it's not biblical. It's a rabbinic juncture. However, there is a remez. There is a sign, a symbol, something hidden in the Torah that shows that you have to read it. says in the middle of the laning, that this ritual should be for the Jews, the Chukas Olam as a statute, Olam means forever. When the Shina is free and the Major says, that it means that it applies forever. Right? And it goes through here. Right? So why then do we have to read it? Because it's a second expression. Now we don't have the paraduma, we can't do the ceremony. So it must be how do we fulfill the mitzvah of doing the paraduma forever? Must be we read about it and we read about it every year. Then we can obviously fulfill this mitzvah. So that's interesting. He says it comes from the words, the chukas olam that it, it says in it that it shall last forever. However, there are other people in the Nite Gabriel, for instance, and who say for mine, don't worry, I bought the special volume when Shab which is for Shabbos, an era of Pesach is a Shabbos, um, so I just bought that volume, I'll go for that soon. He says also something very interesting, and I want to tie it into this week's Pasha and the Egel. I said I wanted to talk about the Egel because it's something that really needs to, to be discussed. He says like this, Para Duma, the, far, the cow, right, is a female. Para, a cow is a female, and the female is the mother of the Egel, the calf. So the Para Duma atones for the Egel, it atones for the sin of the golden calf. Maybe that's why it's red, because the golden calf is unnatural. It's a golden calf. Calves are not usually golden. So we have to bring an unnatural animal to atone for it. So it has to be red, right? I don't know, red similar to gold, maybe. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so maybe that's why we have this strange phenomenon of a special cow that has to be red. Red is the color of desire. Isn't that what it says in that song, Les Miserables, as I call it? Les Miserables. But uh, um, um, my wife's favorite musical, so I heard the songs forever. Um, about uh, red is, is, is uh, the color of desire, something like that, right? So desire of uh, Egel. So therefore, maybe that's why it's. It, 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 Red. Anyway, so where was I up to? I was getting confused with Les Miserables. Right, so what is it in the Egel? Oh, so the Egel, it says you must always remember Zachar al Tishkat, remember, do not forget, how you angered God in the desert, which refers to making the Egel, making the golden calf. And we said a few weeks ago, how do we know that you've got to always read? Pasha Zohar about wiping out a Molek every year, because it says Zohar al Tishkat, remember, don't forget. So what do you mean, remember, don't forget? Ah, you've got to constantly remember not to forget it, 
That's once a year. Once a year, you say it, you don't forget it. So if it's the same with the eagle, you've got to remember the eagle every year. Specifically remembering the eagle. And therefore, they didn't, they would, didn't want to remind you of doing the eagle because it's a bad thing the Jews did. So they said, you know what? Let's read about the antidote, right? The Egel was purified by this golden red, by the red heifer, the red cow. So we'll read about that. Oh, yes. And we'll remember because every rabbi will speak about it in his Monday night sermon, his Monday night uh, class. That why are we reading the Paraduma? Because it atones for the sin of the Egel. That way we'll remember the Egel, the golden calf, and we'll fulfill the mitzvah of remembering the golden calf every year. If that is a roundabout way, enough of a way for you. Um, but anyway, so that is this week, Pasha's Parah. But there is no obligation for women to hear it. So, uh, Jean, you can have a week of going to shul if you wish. But uh, anyway, so you don't, the women do not have to hear it. But obviously the men, as I said, we've not heard this for two years because last year we were all closed. So if the men are available to go to a minion that they feel comfortable with, they certainly should do so. So what is this Eger? What time is it? 7.50. I wanted to speak a bit about Pesach. So let's try and, and get something in without talking too fast. But I know I always make the uh, error of trying to cram everything in by talking too fast. But uh, that's no good. Anyway, so there are many questions about this Eger. The biggest one is Aaron. Aaron was one of the holiest men that ever existed. He was the brother of Moshe. Right? He was the Kohen Godel. He was the first ever high priest. He went into the Kodesh HaGadoshim, the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. He did the whole ceremony, the Kohen Godel, for 40 years. He was a real special holy man. Right? We know at the time of the Second Temple, the high priests were not so holy that they died in the Holy of Holies every year. So in the end, they had to go in with a big rope attached to their legs so that we could pull them out when they died. You couldn't go in to take them out because you couldn't go in. So how would you get the bodies out? So they made it every, every going on had to go in with a rope because when they died, you could slap them out. I always used to think to myself, well, why did you want to be the going on if they always died, right? As well as the answer is everybody thinks, I'm not going to die. Nobody likes to think of their mortality, right? I'm not going to die. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be fine. I'm special. Don't worry about me. But they said, you know what? Go in with the rope. Okay. So... They decided they needed to make this Egel, and they used Aaron. But Aaron was a special man. He was given this great role. So clearly, if it was Avodah if it was idol worship in its basic form, anybody who worshipped idols, right, is not good in Hashem's eyes. So how could then he be chosen to go into the Kodesh HaKadoshim? Doesn't make any sense, number one. Number two, Aaron should have given up his life for this. We know the three cardinal sins that one has to give up their life because life is the whole point of life to serve God. Yes, we don't do, we abandon all mitzvahs for life, but there's no point having life if you're going to serve idols and abandon Hashem. There's no point having life if you're going to commit sexual immorality with a married woman or any of the other 15 women that one is obligated to give up their life for. and Murder. You're not allowed to murder somebody else because the expression goes, who says your blood is redder than mine? Why should I, you give up your, why should you kill somebody to save your life? Give up your life. Somebody has to die, so it should be you. Okay. So those are the three cardinal sins. So how could Aaron do this? He should have given up his life. He should have said, no, I'm not doing this. Yeah, kill me. They said, oh, I'm going to kill you. He said, I don't care. I have to give up my life, right? Thousands and millions of Jews have given up their lives over the years, right? And the Holocaust as well, killed for being Jewish, dying at Kiddush Hashem. So why is Aaron also not doing this? And we can say, well, the Torah wasn't really given yet. Maybe they didn't know the laws. But that doesn't make sense because this is one of the most important things. Should have known this already, this, right? This was the first of the Ten Commandments. Can't have any other gods. So this was a, something they all knew already. So. That's the two big questions about Aaron, his involvement in it, and what it really was. Again, I wanted to try and be, be brief and whatever, so let's get into the answer and explanation. 
and I'm going to link it to, oh, I've knocked the thing that says end meeting for all. No, we don't want to do that. Cut you all off. Then you'll think I'm being very rude and I don't have anything to say and answer the question and I've just pretended to end the meeting, but anyway. So, the other questions are, many questions, right? The other questions are how could they do it? What were they thinking? So on. Now, and of course we have this whole thing with the Luchos, the Ten Tablets, uh, the Ten Commandments on the two tablets, right? Moshe came down with these supernatural tablets that were written by God with these most unbelievable styles and writings, he smashed those. Then he took another set of tablets that Moshe brought up to God. And God wrote on it, but it was in normal writing. It wasn't in this miraculous way or whatever. So what's all that about? First tablet, second tablet, smashing them. So, like this. I'm going to link it to Purim, right? We spoke about Purim last week, about Purim being natural, right? Purim, everything was natural. Hashem was behind the scenes. But that was very strange at that point, because until the Purim story, they always had a prophet. They always had a leader telling you what to do. So Judaism changed, not Judaism changed, the world changed around the Purim story time. But until the Purim story, you wanted to know what to do, the prophet would tell you. Well, most of the time they never listened to the prophet anyway. That's half the problem with all the stories in Tanakh. They never listened, but that's another story. But you can always go ask the prophet. Also, we know the Kohen Godel had the Choshen, he had the breastplate, he had the special breastplate with the Uri Vitumi, the special names of God hidden inside. And you could ask the question, ask a question, certain questions. You can't just ask any questions like, should I marry that woman or should I, I don't know what, you can't ask those questions, right? That's cheap. But if you wanted to know, should I go to war? Should I not go to war? Basic questions you would ask. And the answers would light up, there'd be certain letters, you would read it, and you would know the answer to your question. That wasn't around in the second temple. That already was lost in the second temple, because the world order had changed by then. So the Purim story was the crossover. So until then, you always had a leader that was on speaking terms with God. That's how it all happened. Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, they all spoke to God, they had direct... Okay, last year we had all the conversations about the Maimonides and how he understands it and all this stuff, right? But leaving all that aside, it was direct communication with God, right? Whichever form, however. And of course, Moshe was even more direct to God because he, he could just be walking around talking to God, right? Like in his earpiece, right? He had a God's earpiece, a God's, uh, I, uh, what's it called? An earpod. He had an earpod direct to God, Bluetooth, straight to God uh, up in heaven, right? So he was special. He did all the miracles, he split the sea. It was all very much leader central, right? We had kings, we had prophets, we had leaders, we had the Kohen Godel. It was all very, very, very leader centric, all very special. And these leaders got special communications, the Atta Dishmaya from Hashem. That's how it was. Forum story wasn't like that. God was hiding. That's how it is nowadays. We don't just turn around to God and he tells us what to do. We have to work it out for ourselves. We have to, okay, still the people can get inspiration, but the world changed around the Purim story. So these Jews thought Moshe was dead, right? They thought that they miscalculated the days. It's, it's finished. Okay. Now, they're thinking themselves like this. Ooh, what are we going to do? They didn't know that there could be another way of running things that we have today, they thought the only way life exists, the only way nations exist, the only way Jews exist, is by having some sort of a, a leader, some sort of a somebody who communicates with God, who makes all these miracles, who does everything, there has to be somebody. We can't just be without a leader. We can't just do things on our own. We can't just decide, should I cross the Amsul? Should I not cross the Amsul? Let's have a board meeting about it. Let's discuss it. There were no such things like that in those days. They had the leader. The leader did what we did, and we followed the leader. Oh, we didn't most of the time, but that's another story. Right? Because you have to have the leader in order not to listen to him, right? If you don't have a leader, you've got nobody not to listen to him. So then how are you going to cope with that? But anyway, so they were out of their comfort zone. They thought, you must have somebody. Now, they thought to themselves, Moshe is irreplaceable. 
I mean, yeah, how are you going to replace Moshe? I mean, <laughs> he's, he's done things that no human has done before. Went up to the mountain, 40 days. Now, if you miscalculate 40 days, 41 days, okay, they miscalculated. But still, 40 days, he was on the mountain, right? That's, <laughs> you know, you try living on the mountain for 40 days without eating, without drinking, or doing anything, right? Still not an easy feat, right? A few hours here, a few hours there, makes no difference. Not going to survive then. Although, remember, there's an illusionist called David Blaine. If you've never heard of him, you can Google him afterwards. He's sat in a box above the uh, River Thames. I think it was for 30 days or something or whatever. Uh, but he must have been cheating. And I think he had drink, he had a little drink. I remember because he used to go blow the shofar in L underneath. Because, you know, the Babbage used to go because he's Jewish and blow the shofar. Right? The illusion is David Blaine. But normal circumstances, you don't survive on the mountain. with have gone to heaven. What's going on? So Moshe was superhuman. He was supernatural, right? So how are you going to talk? How are you going to... Uh, replace the supernatural man of Moshe Rabbeinu. You can't choose Aaron. I mean, Aaron's a human. What's Aaron ever done to be supernatural? Yes, he was a great person. And he tried to make peace with everybody. Yes. <laughs> but he's not supernatural in that way. He's an ordinary human being like me and you. So they thought themselves, the only way to top Moshe Rabbeinu, the only way to replace him the man who spoke to God, who wrote the Ten Commandments, but well, he hadn't brought it down at that time, but he went up the mountain, they heard God speaking, they all saw Moshe. The only way they can replace him, they thought, is with a supernatural entity, a supernatural being that would lead them and guide them. And that's what their thinking was, that we're not trying to say that this is our God. We're not trying to say that this is something to worship, something to believe in. No, this is our medium, our vehicle that we will get our communication from God. This is like, you know, like our robot. Nowadays we have robots, right? So this is our robot. That's right. Well, that's good analogy is they wanted to make a robot. They wanted to make a robot that would lead them forward, right? Uh, think of the robots, I don't know, uh, who's the guy from Star Wars? Darth Vader. Right? They wanted to create a Darth Vader to lead them forward in the desert and to take them into battle and to communicate with God. And that's also, hey, if you look in the Torah of Fortune, once this calf came out, it says, Eile Elohecha Yisrael, you are these are your gods. Hashem says, Sicha Me'es Mitzah, we took you out of Egypt. He took out, even if you were going to say that this is your God now, he didn't take you out of Egypt, you've just created him five seconds ago. So they're saying, no, we're saying this is how you can use it, God, for your God that you took us out of Egypt. Now you can use this robot, this Darth Vader fellow, to guide us forward. Not that Darth Vader has any powers on his own. Actually, let's not hear me say that because he might come after me if I say Darth Vader has no powers. But uh, you get the idea. This is a robot and he's being planned, uh, uh, he's being programmed and, uh, you know, remote controlled by God. So God is behind it, controlling him, but we need some supernatural idea. So that is a very, very quick, very quick, very basic way of trying to understand how they made this egg. And of course that was wrong, because number one, even for us to do this, you don't make your own uh, 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 images, that's quite clear, you don't make images and so on, and B, they should have realized that we can get our communications directly from God. Leave it to God. Don't you start telling God, oh, yeah, it's God, Mr. God. You know what? We need to create something for you to communicate. God will tell you what to do. God will tell you. You might appoint somebody else. Or maybe God would make something. You start making your things for God the same way as idol worshippers are called Ovdeke Chavim, the, the, the worshippers of stars. Because in the old days, how it started, they worshipped the sun, the moon, the stars, not because they believed they had powers, but they believed those were the mediums of communicating with God. That's how the Rambam describes idol worship. The end, they all forgot about that. And then they just worshiped them for themselves, but they forgot that their grandfathers worshiped them as the way of uh, worshiping God. We can worship God directly. And now we would make that mistake anymore because we don't have leaders like that anymore, right? As much as you all love me, right? As much as you all think I'm amazing, Right? But I, I certainly know Moshe Rabbeinu. Therefore, 
the whole sense of Purim story. The whole world, the way God chooses, is hidden. He doesn't have that open, miraculous leadership style anymore that he used to do. And that is why we have these two luchos. The first set were the supernatural luchos. That was what was supposed to be with God and Moshe leading us to Yushalayim. We would have been great. We would have had no issues anymore. Everything would have been miraculous and supernatural. Then they did the sin by showing we can't cope with it. God said, right, we're going to smash these tablets and now we're going to make ordinary tablets. Moshe had to make the stones. Moshe had to get them. Where he got them from in the desert is another story. And he had to go up to, maybe he got them from the signpost, right? You know, uh, this way to Israel, 1,500 miles to Cairo, right? You know, maybe he took those stones. Well, but anyway, so he brought the stones up to God and God wrote to them. So they're still supernatural in that way. But it's our doing. We have to work so much harder. And there is so much to write and there's so much to say and so much to talk about this Egel. And again, like I challenged you all at the beginning about to find things that you, you find about the coronavirus, this is something also that you can do a lot of research on uh, and a lot of thought and, and so on to find out exactly how to understand this idea of the Egel, of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, golden calf. And that's why Aaron was doing everything possible to delay them. Because he was like, yes, we could use this, but let's wait a little bit longer tomorrow. Take it off the women. The women are not going to give up their jewelry so easily, right? Because it's expensive. It means a lot to them. So therefore, they would delay it. And by that time, Moshe Rabbeinu came down. And as soon as they would see Moshe Rabbeinu, they would realize, oh, yes, we don't need you, Darth Vader, animore, our little robot. We got our, our, our real person, right? We got our Moshe Rabbeinu. We've got our person that we can uh, relate to. He was trying to delay it all the time. But in itself, in the essence, it wasn't really intrinsically idol worship because they weren't attributing powers to it. It was like creating a robot to, 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 to go forward with a downloaded Google Maps in it so they'll be able to know where to go, right? And download all the various things from God, right? So therefore, they wanted to make a medium that God would communicate with them. Ah, yes, I've just thought at the top of my head. They were probably scared to communicate with God because as the Gemara says, the first two commandments, we discussed this last year, they heard directly from God and they died. They were frightened. They had enough of it. So we can't cope with it. And they begged Moshe, you listen to God and you tell us the rest of the commandments. So they couldn't cope with God. So maybe they were frightened. They thought, oh no, we can't communicate directly with God. Look what happened a few weeks ago. Didn't end very well, right? We had to have life support machines on everybody to revive us all. We couldn't cope with it. Can't be going through that every day. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So they probably were frightened and scared to communicate with God. They thought, yes, let Darth Vader do it, right? He's got a lightsaber. He can protect himself, right? Let him be the one that communicates with God. Let him be the one that dies and gets frightened out of his mind when God communicates with him. Maybe he can communicate with us in a nice, gentle way. Maybe I shouldn't have chosen Darth Vader because he was very scary in the six minutes of Star Wars that I've watched of all the seven movies. But anyway, uh, I've just seen the clips of the end where he says, you're my father, or I'm your father, whatever it is. Anyway, there's a, that's the uh, subtotal of my Star Wars knowledge. But that is just a, a, a brief overview. It's interesting, we talk about now the world is natural. Now the world is natural and we have to do things on our own try and work things out for ourselves, and God hides himself behind, uh, well, like with the coronavirus, God is now hiding behind science. God is promoting all these uh, things and making things happen and all the miracles, the unbelievable miracles uh, that are happening constantly and all the time. The last chapter of the Megillah, chapter 10, right? Now, people usually wake up by then because they know it's only got three uh, verses in it, and it's right at the end. And if it's at the night time, I can go. Five people are usually sleeping after the first two chapters, then they wake up for half a little bit, and then they fall back off to sleep again, right? And, and, and so on. And when it comes to chapter 10, ah, oh, chapter 10, right? This is three psukim, we're done, go home. So it's very strange. What does it say? It says, Achashverosh did, we levied all these taxes. All right, very nice. You have to tell me, I have to delay my going to eat some hummus now because I have to hear about Akash Veyrus having all his taxes. 
And why else does he go on to say, he says, oh, Mordechai and all this and that. He did nice things. I'm like, very nice. Who cares? He paid taxes and uh, he was good. I don't care. I just want to go eat my armadash already. Or in the morning, I want to go off and have my tzudu. I need to hear it. I've heard the Megillah. I know the story. So one of the answers is, because that's the lesson of the Megillah. They want to say life continues. You had this great miracle, this great, wonderful story. The Jews were saved. But God is trying to tell you, now carry on living life. You have to levy your taxes. You have to pay your taxes. You have to try to do the best that you can. Because that's what life is all about now. The supernatural element of life, the supernatural miracles every day, are no longer going to be happening. And even in the time of the Second Temple, they didn't have the miraculous Khoshen and the miraculous communication with God. They didn't even have the Aron, the Ark that had the Luchos in. The tablets wasn't even there in the Second Temple. And if you look through the Jewish history uh, towards the Second Temple, there was all the fighting with the Romans and the Hashmonaim and the Greeks. Uh, and it wasn't a very, very uh, populous Jewish time, and so on. So that is a little bit about the Egel, and how many minutes do we have left? We have three. So I said I was going to talk a bit about Pesach, so I guess we have three minutes. I did actually see uh, a new book has come out this year, How to Make Pesach in Five Days. So I can bring out a book, How to Speak About Pesach in Three Minutes, right? Maybe that could be uh, the new book as well. But uh, anyway. So I wanted to uh, speak about Erev Pesach as a Shabbos this year, right? So people are getting nervous, people are getting worried. What does that mean? So actually, in some ways, it means you probably come into Pesach in a very calm and very relaxed way, right? Especially me, I don't know about you guys. Maybe some of you uh, are much more relaxed than Erev Pesach than me. But usually Erev Pesach is a crazy day. You're rushing off to sell the comments to the goy. Finishing up Kashrin, Shire is getting ready for the Pesach. It's a crazy day, right? This year, Shabbos is nice and relaxed, right? It's Shabbos. All the things are done really before Shabbos. You've got to do all the preparations, like grating the whole fradish, making the salt, water, all that stuff is done before Shabbos. You've got to clean your whole house, it's got to be finished by then. All your Pesach, your is has got to be away, all your Pesach stuff's got to be out. You can have a nice big Shabbos loaf and come into the Seder. Nice and refreshed. So actually, instead of being nervous about it, probably an opportunity to be more relaxed at the Seder and, and, and not fall asleep and not be so exhausted, uh, especially for the uh, uh, the women or the men like me who uh, are clean all the house. I have, a, I have a deal with my wife. I do all the cleaning and catering. She does all the uh, cooking. Um, but uh, anyway, I do help out with the cooking. And uh, I made my first kugels for Purim. So uh, maybe I'll be on duty for Pesach again. But anyway, so one of the things that does need to be done is we need to eat our Shabbos meals. So Shabbos meals are obviously all Pesach. They have some Pesach food, Pesach utensils and pots. However, we're not allowed to eat matzah because we can't eat matzah out of Pesach. So we come into Pesach with all excitement for matzah. Woo! We've not had matzah for ages. 24 hours, and now we can eat matzah with an excitement, so we don't eat matzah, so how are you going to have your lechem mission of washing and having your Shabbos bread? So there are two main ways that you could do it. Um, hotels probably choose the second way, but that is you either eat in a little place or outside or whatever, you take a little challah bun, um, everything else has to be Pesach because you can't put plates away because you've sold them all, and you can't put them away on Pesach to be sold on Shabbos because you can't sell things on Shabbos. Um, so you can't, you know, let's say your hot plate, if you have a Chomet hot plate and you plugged it in for Shabbos, what are you going to do? You can't unplug it, it's out, and so never, so that's no good. So everything has to be Pesach, think. And somehow, so people who have kids like me, you have to make sure, I don't know, you don't give them a lot of bread or, or whatever so they don't run around the whole house making their Chomets, or maybe we'll eat out in the garden. You have your little challah bun, right? And you eat it in the night, you eat it in the morning before the time that the uh, hummus is finished. You wipe down your crumbs or you uh, put them in a napkin and throw them down the, uh, down the toilet. And then you wipe your beard so you don't drip uh, breadcrumbs into your Pesach tiki soup. And then you go and have your nice Pesach meal. And that's how you do it if you want to do it that way. There is another way which, if I may say so, might be a lot more practical and easier to achieve, 
but is less halachically acceptable, and that is to have egg matzah. Why? Because Ashkenazim do not eat egg matzah on Pesach because we eat lechem only, we eat poor man's bread. Poor man's bread is just flour and water, no salt, no eggs, no honey, no nothing. Sfadim, they eat it on Pesach, but we don't. So generally, unless people are ill and they can't eat the matzah or young children, right? it's not chametz, but we don't eat matzah, uh, egg matzah, it's called matzah shira, rich man's matzah. So we don't eat it. So there are people who say, aha, what matzah are we not allowed to eat on Erev Pesach? Matzah, you can eat at the Seder because you don't want to eat the matzah and be full for the matzah when you come into the Seder. But if you're not going to eat egg matzos, because you're not eating them anyway, and egg matzos have a totally different taste. I know, because I bought a box of egg matzos in uh, Costco the other day, because the bracha is mazonas, and you don't have to wash, and I had them on all sorts of spreads. It's like, oh, this is cool, right? You can have this nice cracker matzah that you don't have to wash and bench on. But anyway, and it was a much sweeter taste. I eat matzah all year round, except for Rosh Chodesh. So it was a much sweeter taste. So it is a different type of matzah. So since you can't do that matzah on the Seder, Everybody agrees, if you eat matzah ashira on Pesach, you shouldn't eat it at the Seder. The Seder has to be poor man's matzah, right? Lechem only. says in the puzzle, lechem only, bread of affliction. So therefore, because you can't eat egg matzah for the Seder, you can eat it on Arab Pesach. So I think all the hotels, because eating bread in a hotel uh, that you've cleaned for Pesach is probably going to be a nightmare uh, and so on. So I think all the hotels probably... Uh, I'm guessing all use this idea of having the egg matzos and it's certainly much more practical, much more easier because even if you do make crumbs of egg matzo crumbs, who cares? It's not hummus, right? It's Pesach. So therefore that is a much more practical way of doing it. But again, halachically, not everybody agrees that you can eat egg matzo on Pesach. So again, oh, we're over the time. So I wanted just to... I know people are nervous about it. We're, we're, we're going to get up early because the latest time in Delray Beach, Florida, Mary, you have a different time. I'm not sure what your time is. And people like David and Jean who are going up to Chicago probably have an even earlier time than we do. Uh, I think in Florida, it's 11.22. I'm sure David in, in, uh, in, in up by you further north, it's going to be earlier. Uh, I know New York, it's England is much earlier. It's like 10.30, 10.45, whatever. So... By 11.22 in Florida, you have to finish all your chametz. So you have to get up early. I think I put in that we're going to dive in Shachris at 7.30 in the morning. So you finish, let's say, 9 o'clock, Shachris, 9 o'clock. You go home. Some people have two meals because you want to have shalashudas. You have your bread, and you finish by the time of uh, destroying the chametz, uh, finish eating the chametz at 11.22 in Delray Beach. And then you can take the crumbs and throw them down the toilet and flush them away but don't tell anybody because they might not like that idea of flushing your bread down the toilet. They might not think it's very nice. But anyway, that's what we do. Okay, we'll talk more about Pesach over the next few weeks. In Yitzhak Hashem, we'll have dedicated Pesach Shira. If anybody has any questions, please speak now. No? Okay, all right. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good week. I will see you at Mr. Hashem next week. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.